Uh, today, we're um, going to travel to a beautiful South Shore suburb of Montreal to hear virtually from uh, our friends at Creos. And one of the, um, you know, one of the rules of thumb in public art is that the public artwork has to be designed to match the place where it's being placed. But today we're going to hear about, you know, I mean, like, like all rules of thumb, there are many exceptions. And today we're going to hear about um, public art that's designed to travel. Uh, so I, I just want to say that you know, we, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. We will have a Q&A time at the end, but you can put questions in the chat, chat box at any time. And so I am going to turn it over to Aaron now to introduce Creos. Thanks, Vince, and thanks, Alex, and everyone for being here. Um, we're really excited. Alex from Creos is here to talk about his company that he was one of the co-founders from. It's a family-run business. And it's, it's super interesting to us at LAN because uh, like Creos, LAN Studio is kind of like one of those in-between companies or um, organizations that works with artists, but also works with, uh, you know, community organizations and fabricators and things like that. But the model that uh, Alex has developed is really unique. And uh, like Ben says, they actually work with artists to design projects that can be kind of turnkey design for different locations and they can travel all over the world. Um, you all might re recognize uh, Prismatica, which we were flashing on the images before we started. That was one of Creos's projects who they worked with artists to develop that project. And now we got it here in Cleveland, but it's also been a lot of other places. So um, yeah, we're really excited to hear from Alex. He's gonna talk about his business model and what kinds of artists he works with and all those kinds of things. Um, thank you, Alex, for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Vince, uh, Aaron, and Megan, and uh, Adam also for uh, for kind of thinking about us uh, for this project. Um, today's uh, to this topic, I think, as, as you guys mentioned, would be to give introduction about, you know, a different way to, uh, to bring art, public art, uh, any kind of, uh, it can be either, you know, placemaking initiative or kind of anything to the public, but to think in terms of, you know, kind of a little bit out of the box and how we saw this project coming in. Um, so how uh, we've been, uh, we're gonna use the next hour will be pretty much for me to kind of give a little insight about, you know, who we are, how we started, uh, the things that inspired us, but Mostly I'll show how we do things and what are the different elements that we are looking into when we're doing that kind of projects. Uh, the goal today is really to uh, spark a conversation with you guys and bring different ideas in terms of, uh, I know our audience today is mostly artists and looking at doing things, but uh, it's mostly to think about how can we see this whole public art in a new perspective. So I'm gonna share my screen for a presentation uh, that I have here. So for us, the, the main goal that we have is to kind of make sure that we are comfortable talking about art and business in the same sentence, uh, because for us, it's important to always acknowledge that for any kind of projects, we know that there's financial behind it and is to think about the bigger picture and you know how can we make more art? You know That's the end goal at the end of the day. So in 2014, uh, we're, as Aaron mentioned, we're Montreal-based organizations in 20, back from, I'd say 20, uh, 20, uh, 2010, there was just this huge momentum of new art installation in Montreal, in the province, and, and even in the world. And we're just inspired about, you know, how can we get involved there while all of us at Creos are not creative per se. We don't create, we don't have this, you know, mastermind of, you know, how we see things in different angles that most artists have. But we knew that there was something and people just love to have something uh, to do on public spaces mostly. So as I mentioned, we were inspired by what, what was going on. A lot of artists had this vision of creating, you know, public art that were going to be timeless and be able to translate 
uh, to people in different ways. Uh, I, I think Aaron mentioned that, you know, this piece was also in Cleveland, so you might be familiar with it. But, you know, for us, it was to think about what was working, what kind of uh, installation was, you know, sparking very unique moment. But we were also very interested about what was going on after, you know, the first presentation, because we felt that it was the whole the whole thing was either, you know, commission work, a specific project. And as been said for us, it was really to understand does public art need to be site specific only? And if it is, what is the afterlife? You know, when an artist has a good idea is only for one site. And we want to really go beyond that, that notion of, of site specific. So when we're looking deeper into what was the actual afterlife, this is what it looks like. And for us, it was just mind blowing to think about such good ideas would just go in a warehouse, would just go, you know, taking pile up some dust or even in the garbage. Um, so we wanted to be a part of it and say, we can help, we can be this uh, connection in between artists and between new public sites in between the the afterlife of the first site specific at the uh, presentation. So in 2015, we decided that as a family, without the creative knowledge, I'd say, but with the expertise of um, you know being the artist worker in the room, wanting wanting to help, wanting to do more for the community, but also to at this very moment was also to showcase artists from Montreal to the old world and make art accessible. We know our large scale project, our art sometimes is just, you know, really focused on one single project, but what we want to do is to make it accessible to a wide variety of community, not only the big cities, but smaller cities, uh, smaller festival, big festival, any kind of place. And at that point, it was just the world, you know, the world is just full of public spaces, full of places that people, they're just waiting uh, to be astonished by new work, new experience, and they just want to feel connected. And I think that today, with the whole pandemic uh, situation, we, we have the, the, the need to feel more connected than ever. And we feel that our purpose is even stronger than before. So we started off, you know, a very, very humble start in our family business. Uh, and then a few months later, we've been able to present the first piece uh, with the Quartier des Spectacles, which is a cultural district in Montreal, in London, in one of the, the highest pedestrian uh, park of London. And, you know, as beautiful it was, of course, it was really stressful, you know, because it's, we're off to a very strong start. But we had to take into account so many items when you're thinking about doing international exposition and exhibits and, and, and to present something like that. So after, you know, a few different experiences, few different tests, I would say, uh, in the first few years, we came up with the mindset of everything needs to be, for us, a touring installation. And, you know, what is, what is that? Why would, would we do that? And it's all a continuous process with our first idea of working with organizations that are commissioning work or are are investing in some installations, uh, working with the artists that has been commissioned, but they want to increase exposure. They want to increase, of course, revenue every time that they're presenting a piece. Uh, so it was all in this aspect of making things better, but also having this very durable kind of mindset and sustainable model. So the what I'm going to highlight is few elements that for us and factors that are very important to think about. I think it's mostly before working on a project or while working on a new creation or new, or even sometimes, well, as I mentioned, you know, some of them were created before, but it's how can we adapt them for touring after. But I think overall is just to always have those elements in our back pocket to say, Oh, okay, if if I'm presenting for this specific site, but perhaps if I have all the checklists, I'll be able to present it in maybe ten other cities, or you know, so that that is the main goal for for us. 
when we're thinking about a piece, you know, we're thinking about how can we have an experience that's going to be during the day, but as beautiful as night, because you're always thinking about, you want to encourage people to come in, whether it is on their lunch break or come back later on with their kids at night. Uh, you have to think about workers, you have to think about residents, you have to think about people that are just commuting from one place to the other. So the day and night experience is definitely something that is very important for us when we're thinking about a piece. Of course, the aesthetic portion, I think that's where the magic comes in, you know, every artist are always thinking about how can my piece translate on a visual large impact. Uh, so I think this portion is possibly the most exciting and for artists, but we'll always kind of put forward that, you know, it's always important. We don't like to say that the most Instagrammable, but it's so popular as a word now that, you know, we have to sometimes say, you know, you have to think about family and people they are going to take a picture with it and it's it's very important now of course the meaning the meaning for us uh i think as much as the aesthetic is important i think the meaning is as important because a good story always bring attention it helps people understand why something has been created why would we want to present a thing like that so when we're looking let's say a piece like iceberg that we are seeing now the meaning is to have a powerful message about the climate change, the icebergs that are melting in the ocean. And it's really to think about something bigger than just art. So it gets people to not only stay for 15 seconds because they've seen the piece, but perhaps being a minute and a half because they're discussing with someone they just met about what is going on with the installation, what's why is it there, why has it been created. So it's really to to, to trigger some conversations that are just bigger than, you know, people coming in to take a picture or two. And then we're in a bit more technical. We're always thinking about how can it be autonomous, freestanding? Because when we're thinking about different sites, we know how, uh, how complicated it gets to get the permits to anchor somewhere, it gets the, the, get the approvals to damage anything. So for us, it's always important to think, how can we bring something in and out? And it's the same before and after that we brought a piece. So it just really helped in the process and ease the mind of every single person that we are working with, uh, whether it is, you know, insurance that they won't like to anchor anything there, but also just, you know, cities or any, any public space manager, they'll be uh, uh, really more comfortable with someone, something that is just autonomous on its way. Of course, being from Montreal, uh, we do have perfect condition to test, uh, understand how, you know, harsh weather, very difficult condition will affect installation. So we're always thinking about in, in really warm or really cold, uh, how can something be able to go through, whether it is snow or, you know, whether it is very warm and, and, and you meet uh, something like Singapore. So e everything that we're thinking is what is the worst and what is the best case scenario and how can we manage to make it really easy to adapt in those uh, different um, conditions. And then safety, working in the, in the public, working in, in, uh, in, in conditions that you have uh, families, working in places where we know how insurance can get crazy. We always have to uh, to be mindful of that. Even the craziest idea, we have to have this sort of backup plan of, you know, what can happen if uh, we always use the drunk people scenario of, you know, uh, what what's going to happen if you, if you have those uh, people coming in and how can you handle that? How can you handle worst case scenario? And for us, it's always important, you know, can it, is electricity going to be uh, a problem is the way that it's been built, engineered. Uh, do you have to put it on a building, underground, so uh, where uh, fire trucks will go by? So it's all the little details, but whenever you're thinking about it beforehand, it's just really easier for next steps because it's always an easy answer for every single pe person that will have doubt or will kind of ask any 
related questions about safety. Alex, I just have a quick question. Do you guys have like a engineer on staff or do you work with like local engineers when you go to the locations? Yeah, so we, we do a little of both. Uh, so most of the time what we do is whenever we're creating a piece, we either have an engineering coming at, uh, well, not only creating, but when we're also accepting a piece that we're representing or we're, uh, we're, we're working with the engineer to uh, stamp the installation itself and whether it is electrical uh, engineer, but also structural to make sure that we are able to have all the stamps, whether it is wind related, whether it is electricity, as I mentioned. Um, and we don't necessarily have an engineer on site, but we do have in our close network, all, always an end uh, to have someone that is able to come in to, uh, to make the proper stamps. Because um, most of the time, let's see, smaller cities weren't always asked to have this kind of documentation but whenever you're going or aiming for larger projects i would say that 95 percent of the time you will be required to present some sort of documentation saying that it's not only you think that it's going to last but you have some sort of of uh, study behind it uh kind of uh, to, to help you out with that. Um, I, I would say it really helps even, even with smaller cities or even when someone is not requesting to have those official documents. I think it's always good to have it in hands to just show and support uh, the basic of, yeah, the installation is durable, the installation is safe. And also I would say that we always like to say we love to sleep at night. So whenever we're presenting something, we just love to know, you know, it's going to work. We know that the next morning we won't wake up with, you know, hundreds of calls because something fell or something broke down. Um, sleep is so important for us. <laughs> and then um, for everyone, of course, you know, in today's world, and I think it should have been that way, you know, ever i think everything needs to be made to be accessible for everyone uh for us we always love to say that we work with things that are not gender related uh age related social classes related religion religious race related it's it's really focused on people humans and to have a connection with something but also they are able to share with someone else that is just nearby and to have the exact same experience, but hopefully to trigger some different conversation because um, this person felt that it was that way, this person felt that they understood it that way. So for us, it's important that, you know, there's, it's not, I would say a specific targeted audience, but mostly we want to, to feel that everyone is able to, um, to be part of this whole experience. Alex, there's a question in the chat. Is someone, <clears throat> Lauren is asking, um, can you talk more about what are some examples of what you have to consider with working on a world stage, like difference in uh, laws, for example, in, in different countries and jurisdictions? I, I would say um, some, de definitely, I think, you know, for us, one of the easiest way to wor work on the the world stage is to accept to have partners to help uh, and to build this kind of little network you know I, I think it gets very complicated when you have the notion of saying I want to do everything myself uh, you know for us we're always connecting with either it is our transportation company to ask questions expert uh, let's see it can be any kind of expert in insurance that we're connecting with always taking the proper steps to connect with all those kind of, uh, of person to understand if I want to do a project there, what are the things to think about, how transportation is going to be in, you know, so I would say though, this is the first steps for logistics uh, speaking, because you don't want to have surprise after you've made your agreement with your client or conversations. And then at that point, you're just, it's too much of a mountain for me to handle. I, it's, I, it's too much, you know? So I think it's really to build up this before going too deep. So this makes things a bit easier. And then I, to, to explode or explore opportunities on the 
world stage, I think it's really to to be focused on do you want what kind of opportunities that you're looking at, what kind of opportunities that you're looking for, but also to understand if it's always uh, right for you at the very moment. You know, sometimes we're taking very large uh, steps at one time, but it's sometimes it's too big or sometimes. So it's really to understand uh, the, the angle or what you really want to achieve. Uh, but then, you know, most of the time it's, it's not more complicated when you work working with good teams. So communication is very, very important, whether it is with the client and with your own team, but it's always to understand step by steps where you're going with, you know, I feel for us projects locally are sometimes are as complicated than international project. You know, it's just because there's even more expectations sometimes in local projects because, you know, it's like doing things with your neighbor. So on in international stages, I think it's always to do things where you're also comfortable uh, doing things. And then when you're not, it's to take a step back and understand why you're not comfortable. Why is it getting complicated? Uh, and then ask questions, so many questions all the time, because it's, it, it's, if it's new, then you have to understand, you know, why am I not comfortable? And just many questions, partners. And I think that's the way things need to be built for international purpose. And, and there's a follow-up question to that, Alex. And how, and how do you find places to connect you to local artists when working worldwide? Um, and, and that was a question I had also a similar question, like, you know, how, how do you find the artists you work with? And if you're going to cover that later, that's fine. I just, that's just yeah, come I, I, I think I have a bit on that later, but I think it's very fair and good questions. Um, there, there are different places, different platforms. Um, I think it's, it's also a matter of really doing a lot of research as well. Uh, for us, I think it's a mix of inbound and outbound in terms of how we connect with artists. Uh, it's also we try to position ourselves in different uh, community and different networks. So whenever there's something new that comes out or whenever we're interested in something, we're able to see it. I think it's really it's it takes time, I think, uh, to to define what what are the networks that you want to be in. but. I think you have, we have, we've been tested different ones. Uh, either it is something like, uh, as I, I talk with you guys at Lane, something like Kata Works, that is a platform to connect different artists, but then you're looking, you know, even things like uh, different festivals, you're looking at who's doing that kind of stuff, who's, uh, who's involved, who are the artists that's been invited the, the last five years, uh, who were who participate in those editions so it's you know it takes a lot of i think it you have to to kind of take a moment to you know just see what's going on understand who is doing what and then to connect and for us as a family business as i mentioned is always to if is, is there a fit get into a conversation get to know each other uh, be we're very transparent about do we think we're a good fit also for the artists you know sometimes with the kind of installations that we're presenting, sometimes we don't want to feel that we're wasting the time of anyone. So we're discussing, okay, can we help to make it more as a fit for us? Can we help to uh, redirect someone somewhere else? So it's, it's all part of a continuous conversations, but also to be on the lookout, you know, what are the new trends? Where, what are the new uh, exhibits? What, so it's, it's always to kind of, be very curious about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Did it cover pretty much everything, Vince? Uh, I think so. Uh, Lauren, <laughs> Lauren, do you have? But we can we can follow up and discuss about it later on. As oh, well. Okay, sure, sure. Um, and then when we're talking about you know logistic services and where we think that we're we're very connecting with artists is we're trying to take off the burden of the, what we call the non-sexy items, you know, the things that not a lot of people want to take care of when we're talking about touring. So before going on tour, you know, one of the things that uh, we are always working on is to, uh, to prepare everything 
from the logistics, site layouts, um, and to do pretty much everything from transportation, thinking about uh, do we have all items, working on ATA carnet for orders, uh, and to make sure that we're working very closely with, uh, with our clients to understand, you know, the different sites, the different conditions, because we don't do hundred of site visit. Most of the time, we don't even do a site visit. We rely a lot on our partners uh, that are local because they understand better than us the site. They know where are all the sources. They know how things are going to be, where the truck needs to go. So working and rely on them and asking, again, so many questions about how things are going to be. And then now we are able to prepare and present something for them. So transportation for us, it's a huge part of it. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's one of the portions that sometimes gets a bit heavy on, on artists, mostly when they're individual and they're looking into it. They have so many things to answer, so many things to think about. Uh, so this is one of the things that we're taking care of. Uh, On-site logistics is also for us something that is very important when we're thinking about touring installations we're thinking about being very efficient because we know that having permits to install some, something you don't, you can't occupy for a month a public space because you're building or installing something. So for us, we're always thinking about how can we have something that is so easy to install and it's being efficient enough that not even in two days we're able to build in uh, on site and under one day we're able to take it down. So on-site logistics is definitely something to think about. How can it be plug and play and we can come in, come out, and it's just so easy. Mm -hmm. And then maintenance also, we're, what we're trying always to propose is off-the-shelf things. So we, whenever it comes back from a presentation, we're taking proper steps for, uh, for maintenance to, I think I'll just add, and uh, maintenance to, uh, to make sure that it, it goes back on the shelf and you have something that a presenter or an exhibits one in two weeks and you're able to make it on time with transportation, then it's already ready. Uh, so it's always to think about, you know, not we're going to prepare if we have a request is to do a little the inverse is to have everything ready. And whenever there's a request, it's ready to be shipped. And then I want to give, you know, three different examples of kind of organizations we're able to, to work with and the way that we've been handling it. Uh, two years ago, uh, downtown Detroit Partnership, they commissioned a work. So they bought eight units of Los Trampos uh, by Mexican artist Ezra and Cadena. Uh, they bought a piece for their event for Cinco de Mayo in Detroit. They kind of want to present for a month. And then after, they're just we're probably going to put it in trash, you know, because we don't know what to do. We don't have storage. We don't want to pay for insurance. So the same patterns emerge. And we received a call from David Cohen, director there for uh, public space and placemaking. And he was just, we want to be in your model. We want to make sure that you guys can bring more ex exposure to the piece, but also, you know, how we work is whenever we're presenting piece, they get a, to get a return on their investment, like a kickback that's going back to them and the artists. So it helped them get a bit back of their money to invest in more art. And now full circle, we're bringing back the piece in Detroit for a presentation in April uh, and May. So they've been able to present twice the piece. We've been able to maintain the piece in very good condition, but we've also been able to present it in, I think it's in four or five different cities in the past year and a half. So they've been able to generate a bit of revenue. So they've been able to present two times almost for a price of not even half the price of the first presentation. But Alex, just to be clear, the, so those artworks are owned by an organization in Detroit. Yes. So you partner with them to put it on tour and, and they it, maintain ownership of the artwork. Exactly, exactly. So they are, um, so I would say 95% of the piece are owned by uh, third party, whether it is the cultural district in Montreal, whether it is independent artists or uh, international organizations like Detroit, uh, they own the work, they've been, they commissioned it in the past, 
but then we're looking to generate a bit of revenue out of it, uh, but also to find, you know, ways to not waste a beautiful artwork, you know, so the, 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 our model help kind of have this sustainable model of presenting the piece for a longer period of time and also generate revenue for both the artists and the owner. Hmm. And then speaking of independent artists, we also have in our portfolio some pieces that are uh, owned by individual artists. So this one is owned by uh, Rob Jensen and the Sonic Runaway crew. Uh, they presented a piece, uh, I think it's almost 10 years ago that the first kind of, uh, the, the, the first edition of this particular Sonic Runaway was presented. And then they've made some upgrades, they've made some changes to the piece. And then last year, well, almost a year ago, they connected with us uh, about are there ways to, to, to present the piece in different communities? It's a very large scale piece. Can we adapt it to a, a little more as a, a city settings? Because we understand that we're right in the middle of the desert, you don't have the same kind of context of being right in the middle of New York City. Uh, so we adapted the piece, uh, we made some changes to it, and we've been able to find a venue in London almost three months later uh, to present the piece right in the middle of a very, very different setting and context. So the environment was a bit more uh, urban than the desert and uh, so those are kind of example of having something that existed that was owned by an artist but they were looking at what are the other ways that I can use it how can I can well, how can I get rid of all the storage and the maintenance and the insurance portion of just having a piece because I don't want to put it in the garbage so they shipped the piece back to us in Montreal, and then we've been handling it for the past year and a half. Alex, do artists normally, like, have you guys gotten so well known that artists come to you and say, I have a project that kind of looks like it would fit in your portfolio. Can you help me? Or do you go after artists that you think would be a good fit? I would say that we're now half and half on this. Uh, I think we... Our door is always open to understand, you know, what's going on. People are curious about what we do and they've heard about us in different presentations that we've done. Uh, but then we're also always on, you know, researching projects, researching uh, new trends, researching, you know, what could be done or new. So I would say we're pretty much half and half on this. Uh, we do have artists presenting projects sometimes. Uh, I think most of the time we love to kind of push the conversation to understand uh, you've built this, but in our model, this, 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 and this, could it be done? Can it be changed? Uh, we have uh, one artist, uh, well, one collective, the Urban Conga that they're called. I think uh, you guys work with them in, the, in, the, in yeah, Cleveland. Yeah, we have, yeah. So Ryan and his team, they, uh, they presented a piece to us. Uh, we were introduced by a third party and when we brought a piece here, I think we, well, we've changed nothing from the visual aspect, but we've changed 75% of what was inside to make it a bit more durable, weatherproof. Uh, so we started with this brilliant idea and we just added a bit of our touch to make sure that it becomes very durable and, and easy to install and install in all the factors that I presented earlier. So, you know, it's for us, it's always collaborative how we handle uh, either requests or outbounds that we when we reach out uh, so it's a mix of everything you know we're since we're not this kind of large corporation that needs things to be done in certain ways we're always flexible to see and be curious about new things hmm. and then lately one of the thing is we've been more than happy to uh, to work with artists that had concepts on paper uh, and we're kind of looking at partners that would be interested in may bring it to life. Uh, we started our first collaboration, I think two years ago, about this project that is called Roseau. Uh, what we've done is to, uh, as I said before, we don't have everyone internally, like engineering or you know, 
any kind of suppliers, but we have a very good network of people that we're always keeping interested in what we're, uh, what we're doing. So one of the things that we've done is to take this concept and do our best to bring it to life. And I think we've been highly successful. It's still, you know, concept and prototype and, and process. It's this very large scale project. But we've been able to start from scratch from an artist that a concept who presented a very interesting piece. We fell in love with it and we've been able to find ways and, 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 and support to, uh, to create the units. And that should be one of the new projects either end of 2021, 2022 for us. So those are kind of the three different scenarios of whether it is organizations with uh, existing work, whether it is artists with work that they either have on end or work that is just conceptual. So we're, what I wanted to highlight is really there's no uh, better ways to connect with us or no better ways to create the Torable installations. They're just... We just need to be informed about, okay, those are the things that we need to think about because I never thought about, oh, I could put it in different sites or, oh, I need to think about transportation because if I make such a big project, it would never fit in one truck, you know? So those are kind of the little added value to think about in the, in the process for us that we're always trying to share with, uh, with either artists or organization that commission a piece and they're thinking about, Oh, I want to. Uh, I, I want to see it as more as an investment and expenditure, uh, but also to organizations that want to host uh, things, just to think. Oh, this has been thought for touring, and this one's never been thought of for touring. So, I might just need to look into what are the little, you know, items uh, that will be an added value uh, for us on my site. Uh, so Alex, just, one more. There's just one more question yeah. um, from Lauren. You kind of touched on this with the Sonic tunnel, tunnel, but a lot of public art takes into consideration the community it's in. How is it different with traveling work? I would say that it, it it's always depends of the work. Uh, I think some of them are are very flexible in terms of even though you're you have this generic, I would say, installation. If let's say we have an installation like Prismatica with present in Cleveland uh, where we have 25 units of them and you can place them in different settings. Uh, so you can have the layout that will speak out to either the site, but then whenever you have a strong installation that has a message that has uh, different components, I think, you know, as I said, all communities, they have this sense of they want to see something unique. They want to feel uh, that you're bringing something to us to think about. And what is great is that, of course, you won't adapt it to the community, but the community will most likely ask questions or think about things that the other community before or after won't think about or won't experience it the same ways. Uh, sometimes, let's say you put it in the desert or you put it in the snow or you put it in the sand, you do, you do have you reach out to different crowd, different environments. So it gets that your installations also speak to different levels, I guess. Um, so I think it's when we're thinking about the meaning uh, that I presented before, I think this takes a good portion of it. You know, you have the visual, you have the meaning. So whenever you have so many different items in the piece that you're creating, then it's going to speak on different levels, different communities. So even though it's not site specific to those ones, and it doesn't take into account that's the history of the community or the history of the city, or it will, I think it will translate what the artist is trying to say instead of of just having the piece that's designed to fit, you know, a checklist that the uh, commissioner of the piece has kind of uh, pre-established if it makes sense. <laughs> and so, and Alex, you said that you never, um, almost never actually go to the site your, yourselves or, or you do sometimes? Yeah, uh, so I'd say that our early, early projects, we did go do some site visits. I would say that now, 
you know, with technology being what it is with, you know, either Google Maps or all the site plans and all the information that we can have access to, we never do site visit when we're having a tourable piece. I think when you do site specific installation, uh, I think it's interesting because you have to take into account you know, what you want it to reflect in the this kind of settings. But when you're working with touring installations, I think organizations and hosts, they understand that what's coming in that's been built to kind of fit different settings. So they trust you that it's going to be, you know, adaptable. Uh, but also we ask, so, you know, being <clears throat> always in the, in, in the conversation with the client and their partner to understand you know, uh, will there be seats that can be moved? Will there be activities there? Is there an historical monument that I can be five feet from? Uh, so, you, you know, always, I think our local partner are so, they want it to work as much as we do. So they're always kind of giving up so much information that, you know, site visit is just, I, we would feel that it's just an expense that we could avoid and trying to be as cost efficient as possible. I think it's something that clients appreciate because when they're kind of adding up at the end of the project and doing their debrief, they're saying, well, this is X amount of money that we actually put on the installations and the project itself. Those are the returns that we've made out of it. But every time that you're adding, you know, thousands of dollars, hotel, you know, flight tickets, things like that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, add, it adds up at the end of the day and your debrief, gets a little less positive because, you know, it, it always comes back to how much investment versus how much of the returns most of the times, you know, because that's, that's how it works with those kind of installations. They want to have an impact. They want to, to, uh, to reach out to an audience. They want to increase foot traffic. They want to have people coming in and, and go eat in different, uh, restaurant around. They want mm-hmm. to, uh, to change the perception of a site for a specific amount of time. They want to increase security because uh, art installation brings a, a bit of safeness on different sites. So they want to, to touch on all of this and being cost efficient helps at the end of the day saying that was a success and it just helped us achieve all of our items that we want to do. Well, and another question we have is, um from Deborah, do you ever have to modify a work to fit a particular venue, which you've touched on that a little bit, but you know, I, I would also want to know, like, if sometimes you might have to really substantially change an artwork to move it from one location to another, and, and when that happens, do you, do you, how do you decide on the changes? Do you work with the artist? I assume you work with the artist. In- yeah, absolutely. So how we are able to do what we do with flexibility is we pre-establish what are the parameters that artists are comfortable going in. Uh, so let's say a piece like Sonic Runaway, for example, since we just saw it, if even if it's 432 feet long tunnel, that showcase, uh, that helps you visualize uh, the, the speed of sound through light. So you have music and you see light sound going through light but then if you go under 432 feet long uh it's just physics you know the way that the speed of sounds go through light you just won't see or won't understand what's going on you know so even if i wanted to modify the installations we would just lost the experience that it's supposed to bring um however we do have other pieces let's say that has been created for um 15 units and the site just covers for 12 units then we always need to get approval of the artist and say you know does it work for you does it make sense i know there's the commercial aspect but do you think the impact will be large enough because again at at the very end of each of the projects they're looking at you know they said that it would bring a very large impact, but then they squeeze it to six unit and it was just people were coming in. They were just a little bit, you know, it's, it is what it is, but not very convincing, you know? So sometimes we have to have the hard no of saying, if you don't follow what we're presenting, you won't get the full impact. And without the full impact, you won't be satisfied of what we're bringing to the table. So, you know, sometimes it's a really fine line in between. Do you want to adapt? 
because you want to have the project or do you want to stay true to what you want to you know present because you still have to think about tomorrow you know and to think about there might be a client that will come on site there might be a potential partner that will come on site and kind of judge the quality of the work that you're going to present and if it's not the standards that you want to set sometimes you might rather say i don't want to adapt you know uh but then of course sometimes we've we've it's been smaller it's been different it's been different numbers of units but it's always about a conversation with the artist because there's this will also to you know it's their name that is out there it's our names out there it's the so it's all about also what you want to project in terms of your organizations but your partners around you I think you're muted, Vince. Yeah, yeah. I do that at once, at least once, <laughs> every conversation. But anyway, um, you uh, do you ever reach out to a, a city that, this is a question from Lauren, that yeah. where you want to be, or do, this, do they come to you? I, I would say that for the past five years, there is more outbounds uh, on our end. You know, we've been... We do have a, a business development team to work to that is doing full time to kind of understand uh, what are the different places that would be willing to do things. Uh, it's been a very, very long process of building our database in terms of having this whole network. Uh, we've, uh, we've touched in different industries, whether it is, you know, BIAs that we've done you know, use the, a boot to do in their annual conference to make sure that uh, we're present and people know about all the artists that we're present or to go in a more artist focus uh, uh, groups to, to discuss about things to do and what are their, uh, the places that they're presenting things. So we've done a lot of outbounds, a lot of marketing for our, our, our artists that were present a lot of, you know, kind of MailChimp kind of advertising, any kind of, mm -hmm. uh, we've even had ads in magazines. So we're trying to find all the different ways to not only generate outbounds, but also to create inbounds. And now I think for the past five years, there's going to be so, so many outbounds to kind of make a name out of who we are. And uh, I think now we're, we're becoming at a point that we uh, were starting to get a lot of inbounds about, you know, we've done, we've done things, we want to do more. We've seen what you've done in our neighbor city. Can we do the same? Uh, and I think our repeat business is around 45% uh, every year. So we're able to kind of build on our base of clients and building up on this and adding new clients uh, and organizations and exhibitors. So, you know, it's, it's always a matter of what you're projecting. I think it speaks on people will want to do business again and present some new installations. Yeah, just like land, we keep on wanting to work with you, Alex. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's. I think it's it's just it's just a matter, you know, sometimes about uh, what, as I said, what you're offering or how you do things whenever things are well done and you think about all the angles and all the bad things that might happen then it just gets you the flexibility to work in the settings that you're so comfortable that people feel that it's a smooth process all the time you know whenever you're under the weather or you feel that you know things are getting a bit out of hands people feel it you know they feel that Oh, you you didn't think about this particular items. You never thought about insurance. You never so. But whenever you have your base plan, and then you can walk into it comfortably, people they just feel that okay, you're always one step ahead, and they want to just do it again because it's not a complex process. You know, I don't think a lot of people don't like the complexity of things. Uh, so whenever it's easy or well, that's just the way to make things, you know, people feel, okay, well, they know what they're doing. They, they can take my hands and they're going to walk me through this process. So it's always, you know, that kind of mentality that we're trying to do because we know people that just, they like when people know what they're doing. Um, 
yeah, so pretty much that's where we're at now. We, I think we've added a few cities from the last time we've updated this, but, you know, mostly North America that were, uh, so for us, it's been a very strategic ways to do things. So we've been building up our natural partners that are uh, Canada and the U.S. So North America is definitely, you know, people think like us, people, they, you know, they do things, they, they like things uh, like we do. And the closer we are, you know, transportation is much lower and so you just for us it's been to building up on this to put a reputation on our name uh and then we're kind of adding up on this so we've been able to add a few different cities in europe and switzerland and london and the uk we've done the commonwealth games in australia uh light festivals in uh, in singapore uh we've done a bit of china but again you know whenever you're getting out of the comfort zone things get a bit complicated and it's normal. You know, when we were in China, it was much way more complicated than do things in Cleveland, you know, two different worlds, but it's been, you know, the process of asking questions, asking, is it worth going for being that complicated? Because we're thinking about, we're presenting something that's in Australia. It's five weeks or even six weeks to go there, six weeks to go back. So 12 weeks that is just on a boat. So you have to think about that in your, you have 365 days in a year losing 12 weeks is it worth it you know so all those are the little questions that we're asking especially since we have to report to artists report to our partners so uh, it's part of our, our process so when we're thinking about you know art and business We've been working with uh, 18 world-class installations. A lot of creators are behind it. A lot of investors are behind it. And then for the past five years, I think it's something like 2.5 million that we've been able to bring back to those owners and, and artists. So those are this is money that is available for them to reinvest in their work, reinvest in new work, reinvest in their community. And then for artists, it's to support their business, support their creativity, uh, and for us, it's just part of this sustainable model, you know, that it's just generate revenues. And this is, well, we think that it's 2.5 million that was actually sleeping since, you know, installations were just piling up dust in, in a warehouse. So it's been a very, very exciting journey for us uh, to be part of so far. And just excited to see what's, what's coming, you know, because we feel that public art is, it, it's just at this turning point of being so important with, everything that's going on people needs to be outside people will need to do new experiences new ways to engage in the world and uh, i think that's uh, that's the way to do it this is it that's great i think well, thanks alex it's it's really been informative and um glad to hear from you i'm going to turn it over to megan now for some last minute commentary Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you all for being here. We really, really do appreciate that you continue to show up to these sessions and um, we're glad to see you on our screens. Tomorrow we have insurance basics for artists. This is the second time we're gonna be presenting this topic. Uh, we did it at our 2019 Studio to the Street and found that a lot of artists really were very in the dark about insurance and, and what they needed and how to go about getting it. So we've added another expert to the panel tomorrow. So there'll be a land um, insurance person and someone from Assured Partners to help talk everyone through the complexities of insurance. So we would love for you to join us for that. The, you can register on studiotothestreet.com. And as always, I will be sending you a survey so that we can hear your feedback on all of these talks um, so we can continue to create content and get more funding. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank, thank you, so you so much, much for having us, Alex. If anyone has questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll be more than happy. Great. Good to see you guys. All right. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Bye.